Good afternoon. Good afternoon, LinkedIn Live audience. I hope everybody is well across the country. It's good to be back here for another Philanthropy Friday. My name is Mark Halpern. I'm the CEO of WealthInsurance.com, and we've been so delighted every couple of weeks to be offering insights into the world of tax minimization strategies, insurance, uh, philanthropy, with uh, some great guests along the, the way. And, and today, I'm just as excited about our guest today. We'll be introducing any moment. Um, we have uh, over 200 people registered, but there'll be certainly thousands more who actually get to see the the uh, recorded session that will be posted on LinkedIn Live. Um, we uh, have a chat box in the bottom, so if anybody has questions along the way, please enter uh, a question there and we will get to it. Hopefully we'll have some questions for about 15 minutes at the very end. And we have a diverse group of people who come to our Philanthropy Fridays from professional advisors to uh, charities to uh, philanthropists and to donors of charities. So it's really a mixed group. So hopefully you'll find something that pertains to you particularly. I think today's session is going to pertain to everybody because it's uh, getting towards the end of the year where we've got that runway till December 31st, where we want to know what can we be doing to save taxes and hopefully even convert taxes into charity or at least create some sort of charitable strategies as we go along. Um, I've been in professional practice for 32 years and, uh, you know, I'm on many, many charitable boards, advisory boards, also helping their donors to create the most cost and tax effective gifts possible. Um, and uh, working with their professional advisors. So we really act as a resource and that's really what our job is. And I think if we all have the knowledge and wisdom, there's some amazing things we could be doing to help our clients and to help our donors. So just a couple of just housekeeping before we get Tim in here. And I'm gonna bring Tim in here because I like to see Tim's face. He's a dear friend. I don't want him sitting in the background waiting for me to let him in. So Tim, it's great to have you here. I'm just going to we'll introduce you in a sec. I just want to say a couple of uh, entree points. Um, you know, we, uh, our mission, uh, at least our, you know, we all have to have a mission in life, something our Dharma, uh, you know, our, our, uh, our why is our mission is really to transform Canadian philanthropy by inspiring and educating advisors and charities and donors to incorporate strategic philanthropy into their clients' estate planning, which is a, is a great, uh, valuable uh, exercise for our clients, for sure, because they want to create legacies. And, and also we want to create a Canada that people understand not only what insurance is, but actually what it can do. A lot of certainly high net worth people don't understand how uh, insurance can be used really to magnify your philanthropy. And finally, we're trying to create a, a national community of 100 professional advisors and charities that if all of us are creating $10 million a year of legacy giving, that's 10 million times 100. That's a billion dollars a year. And I feel that that's not a, uh, a pipe dream. It's kind of like crowdfunding. So we're well on our way. Uh, I'm sure there'll be something in the chat that you can find out how you can become part of the billion dollar program. Last couple of things. Why do we do this? So our why is really around a word, a Hebrew word called tzedakah, which is often mistranslated as charity. It actually means justice or righteousness. We have an obligation to give back. If you've got something, you know, it's Picasso said, he said, your goal in life is to find out what your gift is and then give it away. So we want to give away a lot of information to people to help them create legacies. And we've been very fortunate to create $120 million over the last two years. So that's kind of exciting And uh, as we move forward. Now, a couple of did you knows, and then I'm going to go right into Tim. Um, uh, most people don't know that life insurance can be owned and paid for by a charity private foundation or donor advice fund. It's, it's even the most advanced people are not aware of that. Secondly, from a tax point of view, donations in any given year, why this period of time till December 31st is so important, can be used to mitigate up to 75% of your net taxable income and donations over above 75% can be carried forward for up to five years. People are pretty aware of that. But in the year of death, most people are not aware of the fact that charitable donations can be used to mitigate 100% of estate terminal taxes, including going back the previous year. So um, that that's important for us to know. Tim's going to be talking about the alternative minimum tax in a, in a moment. The key learning for me, at least, is that there's no AMT on death. So hopefully we will have an opportunity to, uh, to truly benefit from that. And, um, you know, we have to pay taxes. But I love this quote. There's no law that says you got to leave a tip. And, and Tim, 
who I'm going to introduce now is really um, probably the one of the foremost uh, experts on tax. He's a regular writer for the Globe and Mail, uh, is the CEO and co-founder of Our Family Office, which is an incredible boutique family office, multifamily office boutique, and, uh, and a well-spoken advocate on how to help Canadians. So, Tim, I just want to welcome you today and see how pleased I am that you could join us. Thanks. Thanks, Mark. I'm always uh, glad to come and join you on these kind of things that you were talking about. Two of my favorite things. One is paying less tax and second is giving back and helping to make a difference in the world. So um, I'm really glad to talk about two of those things today. And some of the things we'll talk about today will be focused primarily on giving back and charitable giving and philanthropy. Some of the things are more general about year end tax planning, but I think there'll be something here for everybody. So. Beautiful. So why don't, you know, I, I think um, one of the things that really is, is, is on everybody's mind, although it's still amazing how few people know about it, yeah. certainly how few people are promoting it to their clients. Like they're not going proactively and calling up their, you know, their, their well-heeled clients to tell them about the impact of AMT and certainly the charities as well. And we're also just trying to get things, you know, uh, aligned, but January 1st, 2024, there's going to be a, some, a new, uh, sheriff in town. So maybe mm -hmm. you can tell us a little about the alternative minimum tax and, and maybe what people could be doing about that. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. So if you're not up to speed yet on what's going on with the alternative minimum tax in Canada, particularly if you're a higher net worth or higher income individual, or you've got clients or, or friends or family in that boat, uh, you need to understand what's going on because the alternative minimum tax AMT has been around for a long time, but there were changes made this year to it in the federal budget. And the changes are effective this coming January. And the changes are not particularly helpful. They're not, they're not actually, uh, they accomplish um, some things that uh, are not very good <laughs> that people were not expecting. Uh, but just to explain what it is really quickly, the minimum tax is a second tax calculation. So when you do your tax return and whoever prepares your tax filings, they're doing the, a tax calculation for you. But the, the tax software does a secondary calculation on the, on the side called the alternative minimum tax calculation. And that secondary calculation, it's going to deny certain deductions. It's going to deny or cut back certain tax credits. It's going to apply a slightly different tax rate to your income. At the end of the day, if your minimum tax number is bigger than your regular tax number, you're going to pay the minimum tax number. And what we're seeing this year is that this is now going to apply to a lot more people or, or certainly higher income people than it ever has before and in different ways. So specifically, um, one thing that's going to be happening is, and this is not a positive thing, it's, it's, we're expecting the new AMT rules to impact the amount of donations that are given to charity. Now, why is that? Well, because under the AMT tax calculation, under the new rules, starting January 1st, uh, there's two things that are going to happen that will affect charities. Number one, the donation tax credit that you normally get when you calculate your regular tax, that's being cut in half. So automatically, if you're a high income earner, when I say high income, I mean someone making over 173000 a year, then your donation tax credits are cut in half. The second thing that's happening is if you are donating securities to charities or publicly traded stocks, bonds, mutual funds, those kinds of things, then um, in the past, well, since 2006 anyway, the capital gain on those things has been eliminated when you donate those kind of securities to charity. Now that's not going to be the case any longer under the AMT calculation. They're going to tax you on 30% of that gain. So there is some tax to pay. All of this what it all means for, for those who are thinking of donating, especially higher income people, is that starting in 2024, when you, for every um, $1,000 you donate, you can probably expect to receive about, you know, um, $120, about 12% less in tax savings than you would have under the current rules. So what we're telling a lot of our clients today is think about giving before the end of the year in 2023. If you're thinking about making sizable gifts, particularly of securities over the next year or two or three, this would be the year to do it because you still get the full tax breaks that are available uh, until the end of this year. Then the rules change starting January 1st. Tim, has this all been ratified like January 1st? That's it. This is, these are the new rules. There's no more lobbying Ottawa at this point in time. Yeah. Yeah. That's uh, yes. That's, that's right, Mark. And I mean, the sad part about this is they asked for comments from people. We, we sent in a, a submission to the department of finance. Many, many people across the country did this 
And it seems like they took those 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 submissions and just kind of you know shredded them or threw, deleted them. They, they, it's like they didn't even read them. So it's it's unfortunate. It's going to affect a lot of charities, but it is it is going to be law. It my under, my understanding from the Canadian Association of Gift Planners, of which I'm a member, and I think you are too, that there's 12 billion dollars of charity in in Canada, of which about 35 percent is of the transformational variety, like the people who have liquidity events or you know, sold a business, sold some investment real estate. And at that point in time, Phil, I have enough money. I'd like to give to charity and obviously use that to mitigate some taxes. And that's that's uh, obviously going to be a big it, impact. The reason this doesn't make sense, Mark, and I wrote about this in the Globe Mail back in June, is that, you know, you take a look at charitable giving in Canada it has gone up significantly. It's, it's been on a, um, um, an accelerated curve of growth over the last 15, 20 years. But when you take a look at who is giving, it's higher income people. The, the percentage of Canadians who are lower income who are giving has, is actually shrinking. There's a smaller dollar number and a small number of people giving uh, in, in, in lower income brackets. It's the higher income people that are giving, and this is this these rules change, affect them most significantly. So, would you suggest, Tim, at this point, that if we have a lot of professional advisors on the call, we have charities, they should be in front of this and contacting their people today, you know, with this information, because obviously it's to their benefit. You'll save a lot of tax for your clients. They'll be able to create legacies, and the charities will hopefully get some good money. And at the end of the year, that will be given on a tax efficient way by their donors. Yeah, absolutely. You know, it, it's, 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 um, you know, we don't always tell people to give because of the tax savings, but the reality is if you're saving significantly more tax, whether it's 12%, 15% of the donated amount more in tax savings uh, this year versus next year, this is the year to be thinking about making larger gifts for sure. Beautiful. And the last thing before we move on to uh, bill C-108 planning, uh, as I mentioned earlier, there's no AMT on death at this point, correct? That's Which correct. Which means that really this, while this is uh, above the water where people are aware of it and sensitive to it, this is something that should be spoken about with every high net worth client. How do we incorporate strategic philanthropy, donating shares and donating other assets, you know, donating insurance, et cetera, that will not have that impact on AMT when it comes to tax mitigation. And, uh, and you know, Mark, AMT also does not apply to corporations. So if you have an, a client or if you are an individual that has a holding company or an active operating business, a corporation, and you want to give out of the company, you're not going to face AMT issues. In fact, that's um, a big planning opportunity for a lot of people. What we are doing now with at least one client uh, I can think of right now, we are actually transferring certain securities, which the client wants to donate to charity, Will be will be transferred into his corporation and making the gift out of the company instead. So that may be a planning opportunity going forward. And uh, the math on that, I, I'll probably write an article about that in the Global Mail sometime soon because the math is is compelling on that. Well, maybe that Global Mail article that you did before, you'll send that to us and we can post it on the LinkedIn Live uh, recording that gets sent out again. And I guess uh, also, Tim, if people want more information about this, so they've got clients or situations personally themselves, they could reach out to you, obviously, to, to, to see how you can help. Absolutely. That's great. Yeah. Great. That's okay, great. let's go on. Let's, let's okay. talk about C-108 planning. Yeah, so B, Bill C-208 was a, a bill that came into law in June of 2021. Now, what was happening was it used to be more tax effective, believe it or not, to, to sell your business to somebody outside the family than it was to actually sell the business to your kids uh, or transition the business to the kids. The, the tax bill was lower if you, if, you, if you transitioned to somebody outside the family, which didn't make any sense. So the government came up with, well, there was a private member's bill introduced in, in the legislature and it became a law in June 2021 to fix that problem. So now you can actually transition your business to your kids at the same tax cost as you as it would to, to someone outside the family. Now, when they drafted the law, there was a little loophole that they left in place accidentally. And, and tax professionals have been taking advantage of that loophole um, uh, for the last little bit. And in fact, the government saw that and they said, oops, uh, we made a mistake. Uh, let's fix that. And so they are fixing it. But it doesn't come into play. It doesn't come into effect until January 1st next year. So there's a window of time between now and the end of the year to still take advantage of Bill C-208 in, in a more creative way. Now, I'll, I'll walk through a simple example here. So if you want to flip to the next yeah, slide. Yeah, I'd love to. Yeah. Um, um, 
and this slide really just talks about some of the stuff I just I've yeah, just let's mentioned. Go through, so let's go through the case study, I think. Yeah, yeah. let's go through an example. Take, take a gentleman, let's call him William. He's a business owner. He's got a company with cash on his balance sheet. And let's say his company's worth, you know, $10 million, just to pick a nice round number. And he would like to access, let's say, a million dollars of cash. He wants to get money, a million dollars out of his company at a very effective tax rate. Now, William also wants to introduce, introduce his son, let's call him Trevor, into the business as maybe a part owner. So Trevor's been you know, working in the business um, and he's eventually going to own and operate the whole thing one day. But his father has decided, William's decided to give him some ownership today. So how can he accomplish both these things? What he can do is he can use the rules introduced by Bill C-208 to take out a little over a million dollars of cash at capital gains rates. Okay, we'll, we'll show you the math here in a second. He can also provide Trevor with, in this case, he's going to give 15% or transfer 15% of the business to, to Trevor. So let's walk through how this works. Take a look at the steps. So, but let me just show you this, first of all. In this, in this example, William's going to be taking money out of his company at capital gains rates. So let's suppose he wants a million dollars in his pocket. Well, how much does he have to pull out of the company to be left with a million dollars in his pocket? Let's look at the very top line there in the red box. You see, if it was salary that you're pulling out, William would have to pull out $2.1 million to be left with a million after taxes in Ontario in, in this year. If he pulls it out as dividends, he, he's going to have to pull out $1.9 million to be left with a million dollars after taxes in his pocket. But if he pulls it out at capital gains tax rate, he, rates, he only needs to pull out $1.3, $1.36 million to be left with a million in his pocket. So it's more effective, efficient wow. to pull out money at capital gains rates. Wow. So let's take a look at how we can do this using Bill C-208. So if you move to the next slide. That's let's, a huge difference, Tim. It is. It's a, it's a very big Enormous. difference. Enormous, yeah. So here's what here's what William's going to do with his son Trevor. He's going to Trevor's going to set up a, a new holding company. Let's call it Trevor Co. And Trevor's going to own 100 of the Trevor Co. Uh, see, you can see Trevor there's cleaning floors in the business. He's working very hard. So his dad's giving him uh, wants to give him some ownership. So what William is going to do? He's going to sell 15 percent of his common shares in his operating business to Trevor Co. So in other words, he's transferring 15% of his shares to Trevor Co. As a, as a, by way of a sale. And he's going to take back, and that, that, that's worth $1.5 million. We said the company's worth $10 million, So 15% is about $1.5 million uh, to William. So William's going to sell to Trevor Co. 15%, $1.5 million worth of shares. He takes, takes back a promissory note. Now, William's going to realize a, a capital gain when he sells these shares. Uh, he can use his lifetime capital gains exemption to shelter some of that gain this year. And that's about $970,000 of shelter he'll get this year. So the remaining gain, which is about $528,000, well, there's going to be tax on that gain. And the tax is going to be $141,000. Okay? Not a lot of tax, but $141,000 on $1.5 million of money coming out of the company. That's not too bad. So move to the next uh, uh, slide. We'll take a look at the next steps. Mm -hmm. So... Now what's going to happen is the operating company, which is partly owned by Trevorco, is going to pay a, a tax-free dividend up to Trevorco of one and a half million dollars. It's an intercompany dividend, so it's tax-free. So Opco can pay this one and a half million up to Trevorco tax-free. Then Trevorco is going to take the one and a half million dollars cash. He's going to pay off the note that's owing to William, owing to, owing to his father. Okay, so William receives the one and a half million dollars. He's going to have to pay taxes of $141,000, as I said, to CRA, but he gets to keep $1.3 million for himself. Wow. And the tax he's paid is just 9.4% in this example on, on the amount coming out of the company. So this idea can work great to pull money out at capital gains rates. Now, move on, move on to the next slide. Let me share with you what's changing starting in 2024. So Right now, in this example, William did not give up control of his company. He only sold 15% to Trevor Co., to his son. Mm -hmm. Starting January 1st, he's going to have to give up control of the business in order to accomplish the same thing. Wow. It's going to have to be 51% or more for, Tre for Trevor to, and, and for him to extract money out of the company on a, on a capital gains rate basis like that. So, you know, today there's an opportunity to still do it for less than uh, 50%. It could be any percent you want. Uh, but but there's a small, small window to the end of the year to get this done. Wow. And, and Tim, who executes all of this? Is this what you do at, at our family office? 
Yeah, I said, certainly we can help with this kind of planning. Um, a, a tax specialist at a CPA firm should be able to help. You're ultimately going to need a lawyer, a tax lawyer involved as well to draft some legal documents up between, you know, you and your, your child, if you want to do this. Um, so it, it's, it, there's a bit of a cost to it, but you know, you're saving so much tax. Oh, it's compared to what you'd pull normally out of the company. At what, it, yeah. It's amazing. To, is there enough time? Like I, I'm sitting here, it's October the 13th right now. Sure. I'm like all of this, like, again, it comes back to AMT being in front of it with clients and donors, et cetera. Is there Lots enough of time? time? Yeah. yeah. Plenty of time. I think if you wait till 15th of December, your lawyer and your accountant are going to probably uh, have a have a fit. But if you want to do it sometime in the next, you know, six weeks, eight weeks, there should be lots of time. Fantastic. So people should certainly reach out to Tim or to me, and we can help you uh, get that organized. But that's a, a brilliant strategy and such a huge tax saving. Again, finding those windows of opportunities. Let's talk okay. about uh, capital gains and losses because uh, people know about capital gains. I don't know how many people know about trigger and capital losses, but obviously there's some great opportunities. Yeah, I know what I want to talk about here, uh, Mark, is a couple things. One, I do want to talk again about donating securities to charity. And yep. specifically, there's a, a formula I want to share with people. So if you move to the next slide, mm -hmm. um, I want to share an example here. So back in 2006, the government changed the law so that you can donate securities to charity and you eliminate the capital gains, right? Which is, which is great. So let's take an example of an individual. Let's call her Wilma. And she wants to sell a particular stock, let's say ABC shares or whatever. And, and she wants to, she, she's decided she wants to sell for, for whatever reason. Maybe she's not happy with the future performance. She's not expecting great performance out of the stock in the future, whatever. She wants to do, donate some of the shares to charity, but maybe not the full amount to charity. So, but here's the interesting thing. A partial donation of this these shares that she wants to sell, a partial donation can still eliminate all the tax. So let me show you how that works. Let's watch an example. So Wilma owns shares of, okay, let's call it XYZ Corporation. Let's say the shares are worth $100,000. And let's say her cost base is 50, 50,000. So she wants to sell and she also wants to donate some. Well, if she were to just sell all the shares, all right, all the shares, forget the donation for a second, just sells all the shares, that's going to trigger taxes of $11,500. Now, that's at a marginal tax rate of 46%. So she's not in the highest tax bracket, but she's sort of up there in the second highest tax bracket. So what she's left with in her pocket after taxes is $88,500. That's she, And Tim, that's that's amazing that she has to realize she's not worth 100,000 on paper. It's only worth 80, maybe on paper she's worth 100,000, but in right. reality, it's only worth 88,500, whether she likes it or not. And if she's in the highest tax bracket, it's even, even a bit more tax than that. Mm -hmm. Now, let's move to the next page and continue the example here. So Wilma could, what she could do is she can actually donate out of the 100000 worth of shares, $20,000 worth of shares to charity. Then she can sell the balance, the other 80000 she can sell and keep the money from that. Now, what's the result here? Well, there's going to be $9,200 in taxes owing on the 80,000 of the shares that she's selling and, and, and keeping the proceeds and okay, no mm -hmm. donation there, mm -hmm. but she's going to pay $9,200 in tax there. And there's no, but there's no tax to pay on the shares that she donates to charity. So in fact, what she's entitled to is no capital gains tax on those shares. And on top of that, a donation tax credit that's going to be worth $9,200. So interestingly enough, the cash in her hand after the donation is going to be 80,000. All right. So in other words, she's her, her donation tax credit from that partial donation is fully enough is enough to offset all the tax on the rest of the shares. So how much cash does she now? So she's going to get, keep 80,000 in her pocket. 20,000 goes to the charity. So how much cash did Wilma give up due to this donation? Well, she would have received $88,500 before if she donated nothing. But, but now by donating 20,000, she's only out of pocket 8,500. So, so it, it's a charitable arbitrage opportunity here. Love that. The gift, the gift doesn't cost her that much compared to what the charity receives. Now move to the next slide here. I'll, I'll share with you the formula for this. So how do you know out of a hundred, about a hundred thousand dollars worth of shares, how do you know how much to donate to charity and how much to keep for yourself and just sell? Well, this formula kind of shows you that. It's, it's the fair market value multiplied by fair market value less your cost base, in other words, your gain, divided by three times your fair market value, subtract your ACB, your cost base. 
So move to the next slide. You know, in, in the example of Wilma, here were the, here were the numbers. If you do the math on it, it's it's twenty thousand. Twenty thousand is the amount to donate to eliminate all the tax, and it's it's approximate in some provinces, but it's it's roughly correct. So there you have it. Tim, amazing. You know, I'm I'm still amazed that uh, most of Canadians, and I'm talking about 95% of them, are still giving cash checks and credit cards for their charitable donations. Yet everyone has some appreciated non-registered mutual funds, stocks, ETFs, yeah. segregated funds. And as you showed with Wilma, it doesn't all belong to you because when you sell it, it's going to cost money. So if you're charitable and you want to save taxes right now until December 31st is the time to go ahead and look at what are your biggest, fattest capital gain stocks? You know, donate some of them like Wilma did or all of them. And if you're not ready to go ahead and, and give them to a specific charity right away, why not just stick them into a donor advised fund as a parking lot and just keep them there for now? But that conversation has been had. I've uh, I met with a, an 80 year old widow Tim recently, who uh, she was quite proud of the fact that she was worth $10 million and she'd done it all on her own until I said, you know, you're only worth six and a half. Yes. Or she had a million dollars of capital gains taxes in her non registered portfolio. Nobody had told her about that. So it's really important that people get some, put some attention to this. For sure. Now, just, just to remind you, Mark, we talked earlier about the alternative minimum tax. So in Wilma's case, um, if she was, a high income earner, her income was over 173,000, then any donations like these securities after this year will have a reduced tax benefit. So incredible. So yeah. anybody with stock, again, appreciated securities, non now is, the year. now is the year. Okay. Let's talk about losses. Yeah. So there, I know uh, capital losses are a fact of life. Um, and sometimes they're easy to use up and sometimes they're not very easy to use up. So let's get consider a case where somebody's got, uh, one spouse has capital losses, but doesn't have any capital gains. So can't really use up the losses. But let's say the other spouse has capital gains, right? And, and insufficient losses. So if we could just transfer the losses from one spouse to the next, we could actually use them up. The interesting thing is there's a, a, an easy way to do this. So let's walk through it and I'll show you an example. Um, let's say we've got somebody named Anne and Anne owns publicly, publicly traded shares. And Let's say she paid 500,000 for the shares, but lo and behold, they're only worth 100,000 now. So she's lost $400,000. But let's say she's got no gains. So selling these shares at a loss isn't going to help her very much. She's got no gains to offset them against. But let's say her husband, Henry, reported capital gains for of $400,000 maybe last year. So we could transfer to Anne, if we could transfer Anne's sorry, losses to Henry, then Henry could take those losses, carry them back to last year and recover taxes that he would have paid. So let's take a look at how that might actually work. Mm -hmm. um, it's amazing. There are not many steps to this and it's really easy. Three steps. Number one, Anne's going to sell her public co-shares. She sells them on the open market. She triggers this $400,000 loss. She can't use the loss. So we don't want to stop there. So number two, step two, Henry's going to buy back those same shares on the open market for their value. And the value of those shares is only $100,000. So he's, you know, she sells, pick, pick a number, 400 shares. He buys back 100 shares, you know, sort of buys back the 400 shares. It's going to cost him $100,000 to buy them back. The result though, is that the $400,000 that Anne realized, she can't claim. Because why? Because the superficial loss rules apply. Those are the rules that say, if you sell something, something at a loss, and then you or someone affiliated with you buys back that investment within 30 days, you can't claim your loss. So in this case, Henry is affiliated with his wife. And so if she sells at a loss, he buys back the shares, the loss is denied. But here's the nice thing. The loss is not denied forever. What happens is the $400,000 loss that gets denied to Anne gets added to the cost base of Henry's newly acquired shares. So even though Henry only paid 100,000 for his shares, his cost base is actually 500,000 because the loss is not, you know, they're not getting rid of the loss forever. So now Henry can now take those publicly publicly traded shares, sell them for their value of 100,000, and he's got a capital loss that he can now use. So it's a very easy way. It's a sell and a buy and a sell. So if you move to the next slide, I'll just show you the timeline because the timeline's important here. 
So step number one, Anna's going to sell her shares at a loss. Keep in mind the 30-day mark. The clock starts ticking at step one when Anne when Ann sells. That 30-day mark is an important mark. So what has to happen is sometime within that first 30 days, step two has to happen where Henry buys back the investment. Could be could be day 29. That's fine. Just before the 30th day. And he just buys those on the open market? Just buys them back on the open market. That's it. Step three, Henry sells them, and that has to happen after the 30th day. So that could be day 31. And as long as you get that timing right, it's automatic. The loss transfers from Ann over to Henry, and there's nothing special to file with CRA here. No special forms. Just Henry reports the loss, Ann doesn't, and you're done. Amazing. So, Tim, right now, we're always thinking about the future. This is something going on in the back. If somebody, as we said, a couple where somebody had a big gain from last year, because my understanding is that capital loss can actually be carried back up to three years, correct? It can and carried be. And carried forward indefinitely. That's right. That's right. Exactly. You got it. So it's not even a year ago. It could be that Henry had a, a capital gain. Right. Exactly. So that's, what, that's right. What a, so what a, what a fantastic strategy to be aware of, to be able to help our clients. So how many people know about this, Tim? Like it just um, seems so, it just seems, you know. I, I don't know how many people use it. Um, you know, we I've written about it before in the Globe Mail. This is one of the ideas I don't mind sharing in the Globe. Uh, and so I hope it's being used. But you know what? Listen, if you end up recovering tax because of this, say, you know, Henry gets taxes back that he paid last year. What are you going to do with that cash? Well, why not donate it to charity? You lost, you, you had it, it wasn't in your pocket anyway. So it didn't belong to you. At least be, let's be generous with it be now. Generous with it. So there's right, kind of like found money. So I always say to clients, Tim, that, you know, even when donating uh, appreciated securities, you know, donate them if you love them so much. So buy them again. And the same thing goes with the losses. If you love those, and you think there's a potential, so sell them, wait the 30 days, and then buy them again, you know, and exactly go from there. Yeah. Very um, good. Let's move on and talk about some business owner stuff. Yeah, this so, stuff is really important. Please. I want to I want to share a couple of ideas here that I think you might find uh people who are business owners might actually find really helpful. The first idea I want to talk about though is are some compensation ideas. So um we won't jump into this slide just yet. We'll talk about some yeah. compensation ideas, but here, here's some ideas for you. Um Consider what we call a capital gain strip. Now, we talked about an idea previously, a Bill C-208 idea, where people can get money out of their corporations at capital gains rates, or even lower than that, because they're using their lifetime capital gains exemption. There are other ways to get money out of a corporation at capital gains rates. I won't go into the many ways to do that. Um, tax professionals who do this all the time will know how know multiple ways of doing it. But this is an idea that won't stand the test of time. CRA doesn't like it. They know it exists. It's illegal. It's perfectly fine. Um, but the time to take advantage of capital gain strips is now not, say, next March, I don't think, because I think we're going to see, well, we will see um, the general anti-avoidance rule applied, and we may see other laws that come in, into play that will prevent this from happening, this idea. But what it allows you to do is to, instead of paying tax, tax on salary or dividends, you pay at capital gains rates, which are, depending on your province, you know, obviously half the rates of salary. So it can make really good sense to consider a capital gain strip. That's one compensation idea I want to talk about. Next one, I want to talk about avoiding tax installments. For people who are self-employed quite often, they, they may pay themselves, for example, dividends out of their company. Mm -hmm. And there's no taxes deducted from dividends before you receive the payment. You're, but you have to report it on your tax return and there's going to be tax to pay at that time. So what ends up happening for a lot of people is they pay themselves dividends out of their companies and they now have to pay installments every quarter because, you know, if you got pick it, pick a number, hundred thousand dollars of dividends last year, um, CRA is going to expect you to pay installments on, on your income. If that's sort of a consistent thing every year. Um, so there's kind of a trick we would, we used to play um, that works really, really well that allows you, allows you to avoid tax installments altogether, maybe forever. So how does that work? Well, rather than paying yourself $100,000 of dividends every year, you can pay yourself $200,000 of dividends every second year. Now, why does that work? How does that actually result? How does it result in no installments? When you calculate your tax installments, it's based on last year's tax bill that you had to pay or the current year's tax bill you're expecting. You get your choice. You can choose which year you want to you wanna pick. So if I pay myself $100,000 of dividends last year, but I'm not going to pay myself anything this year, I'll use this year as my base for my tax installments. I won't have to pay any installments. 
Okay. Uh, likewise, next year, um, if I pay myself um, um, tax installments next year, or if I pay myself dividends next year, I can use this year, the previous year, as my base for my tax installments, and still pay no pay no installments throughout the year. So, because you get to choose last year or this year in terms of your base for your tax installments, just pay yourself nothing every second year, and you'll never have to pay tax installments. So, wow. I love that. How many people are aware of that, Tim? Or is that something uh, also published in the Globe and Mail that, you know, only if people were fortunate enough to read it will know about? I haven't actually written about that one, um, but it's been around for a long time and uh, it's a great idea. And by the way, you know, it, what it does is because you're not using that money to pay tax installments every quarter, maybe use that money and make some gifts to charity instead. Instead of paying CRA, pay the charity. You know, so that's a great, great idea. The last thing I want to talk about as far as compensation goes is this will also help charities is if you want to make a large gift to charity this year, you could pay yourself dividends this year or salary this year to give yourself some cash and then make that donation before the end of the year. But you're going to pay tax on a dividend if you pull the money out of your company this year or even salary. So why not consider this? Consider, if you have to, borrowing money to make a gift to charity by December 31st, right? You get your donation tax credit. Then January 1st, pay yourself a dividend out of your company. And you're not... You won't, you pay tax on that a full year later, but now you've got the cash out of the company to pay the debt, pay, pay the bank, the bank back, pay the loan off. So just another day, it's a timing idea, but allows you to kind of take advantage of donation tax credits and not have to pay tax. So if, if, if I'm a charity and I'm a fundraiser, I mean, these are, these are ideas that most of the major donors probably, unless they have you as a, as a, as a professional might not be aware of, but certainly it's a way of helping people to create, you know, certainly, uh, you know, valuable donations at the end of the year where it's a, it's a big tax benefit for them and again if they're borrowing that money and just using the timing of when they pay off that pay that dividend uh that's fantastic you might borrow the money for a week that's all you know just enough time to make a donation and then pay it off later so that's an idea the, the next idea i want to talk about we will bring up a slide for this and it's um retire there we go this idea is a tax idea that's going to allow you to make a huge difference for charity but also eliminate tax at the time of your passing away on your private company shares. So this is again for business owners. It could be a holding company, it could be an active operating business. Um, this is not necessarily a year-end strategy, but I wanted to share it because it is, it's a it's it's a strategy we use all the time and I, I just love it. So this is we're, we're gonna, what we're gonna do here is we're gonna create a structure that's gonna eliminate tax on private company shares upon death. It's gonna provide a meaningful gift to charity and leave a lot more to your heirs at the same time. Now, what we want to do when we set this up, we want, we want to be mindful of a couple of things. We want to keep things as simple as we can and keep the cost of impl implementing this fairly low if we can. What this idea is, it, it, we call it the insured donation of shares. It does involve the use of life insurance uh, and involves donation of private company shares. So let me give you a, a simple example. Take an individual, call him a shareholder. Let's say he owns a holding company, could be an active operating business, that's worth, let's call it $10 million, okay? Well, when this individual dies, there's he's, he's going to be or she's going to be deemed to have sold their private company shares, okay? Well, what's that going to cost them in tax? Well, in Ontario this year, that would be almost $2.7 million in taxes. So it's a pretty high tax bill, but, you know, 27% or so. Um, what we can do is we can take steps to eliminate this tax liability and help the family and charity at the same time. So let's go to the next slide and talk about the steps in this process. There are really four steps, okay? The first step is this. At the time that you, you pass away, not all of your shares, but a portion of your shares of your private company will be donated to a charity. Now, most often it makes sense to do this to a private foundation because many charities are not set up to receive private company shares as donations. But the idea is that even if you use your private foundation for this, the money will then flow from there out to your favorite charities. Tim, I also want to do add though that there are certain community foundations that have experience with this. So if somebody isn't ready to set up a private foundation or give directly to a particular charity, they could set up a donor advice fund. Absolutely. And, and so maybe talk to you or, or me about that. So in case they don't want to set up a private foundation for sure. What'll happen is though, you're going to donate some, some of the shares. And normally that's somewhere between 35% and 40% of the shares. 
that will often eliminate the tax on all the shares uh, when passing away. So, uh, so that's the first thing. Upon death, some of the shares will be donated to charity. Call it 40%. The, the math will be different for everybody depending on how much you want to give and the value of your shares and that kind of thing. The second thing is that this does, does involve life insurance. And what's going to happen is life insurance will be owned by the company on your life. And so when you die, the life insurance is going to be paid into your corporation. And in my example, it was a holding company. And these proceeds of life, this life insurance proceeds will be used to buy back those shares from the charity. Because let's face it, the charity doesn't really want your private company shares. What or does the family want to have the charity owning your private company shares? Exactly. Right. Normally you want the private company owned by the family, not by a charity. And you want, you want the charity to have cash. So the life insurance will be used to buy back these shares from the charity. But there's something else that happens at the same time. When the life insurance gets paid into the company, it also creates this thing we call a capital dividend account in your company, which gives your, your surviving family members an opportunity to pull money out of that company tax-free af after you're gone. Okay, and, and the way we would normally do that is we would have your family redeem some shares after you're gone. And, and when you redeem those shares... That's often taxable as a dividend, but because of this CDA, this capital dividend account, it becomes a tax-free redemption. So that's a benefit. So, so far we've got two benefits. We've got a donation tax credit in the year of death, which eliminates tax on the private company shares. We have a capital dividend account, which allows the family to pull money out of the company tax-free. And the third thing we get, the third tax benefit is that when we do that redemption, we sort of use up that capital dividend account after you're gone, your family pulls money out tax-free. By doing that redemption, it does something else. It creates a capital loss in your estate, a capital loss that can be claimed on your final tax return. Okay, so we move on to the next slide for a second. I'll just summarize the benefits here. So the benefits are, number one, a meaningful donation to charity at the time of your passing away, maybe as much as 40% of the value of your, your company, and then tax savings in three ways. Number one, a donation tax credit, which is going to reduce or eliminate the tax owing on the private company shares. Second, it creates that tax-free pipeline out of the holding company to, to your family through that capital dividend account we talked about. And thirdly, it creates a capital loss in your estate, which can offset other capital gains in your year of death or other income in your year of death on top of the, the private company shares, the capital gain in the private company shares. So if you move on to the next slide, I'll just show you some math. This is actual math we did for uh, uh, a family one time. We did some uh, math on it for them. In this case, you can see the value of the comp company was about $5 million. We said, let's assume a $5 million value to the corporation. Well, what happens if they did nothing? In the do-nothing scenario, that's the column on the left-hand side with the number one above it. That's the do-nothing scenario. In that case, about $1.3 million of tax will go to CRA and the family effectively gets the rest of the value of the company. So 3.6 million, we'll call it. And then some people would say, well, Tim, I really like this idea of donating, but I, I don't like the insurance part of it. So what would happen if I just donated shares, but didn't actually buy insurance to fund this? Well, that's sort of column number two in the middle where you donate shares, but there's no insurance. In that case, you can see you've eliminated most of the tax to CRA by making a $2 million donation to charity. So out of the $5 million of value, you're donating 2 million or 40% to charity. So the charity gets 2 million of value. Your heirs get the difference. They get to keep about 2.7 million. CRA gets a little bit. But the problem is your, the charity in this case owns your private company shares. It doesn't have any cash. That's not ideal, right? So that brings us to, to column number three, which is where you donate the shares and you put insurance in place, in this case, you can see the net value to the heirs is actually very much higher, $6.2 million. The charity gets $2 million of value, and that's all cash. That comes from an insurance policy. Okay, In this case, um, it's about a $5 million insurance policy that was purchased. It doesn't have to be that much. You can choose whatever amount makes sense to you and your advisors, but um, in this case, it was a $5 million policy. So what happens is some of that insurance gets used to go to the, you know, goes to the charity because it buys back the shares from the charity. The balance actually goes to the, the fa family. And I, and I apologize. It wasn't a $5 million policy. It was a $2.5 million policy in this case, not $5 million. So, so 
now you can sort of see on the very right hand side, how do we get to this $6.2 million that we were talking about? How does the family actually get 6.2 million out of this? Well, well, the share value after taxes is 3.6, but we're saving tax because of this idea, right? There's there's actually $2.8 million of tax savings to be had to, to, in, in the ways I described earlier. So add that back. And then of course, there's some net insurance benefits which still go to the family because not all the insurance is being used to fund the donation. And then you have to subtract from that the cost of the insurance premiums, okay? But in that case, um, this was an actual math we did for an actual client. Um, it was about a $6.2 million net benefit to the heirs at the end of the day. Amazing. So, so Tim, I'm, I'm amazed still because we do this all the time as well with you as well. And, and um, you know, everyone knows about donating appreciated public non-registered securities, but it's remarkable how few people know that they can donate uh, private company preferred shares. And, 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 and it's, it's, you know, we've met with so many accountants and, and individual, you know, business owners and philanthropists who are just not aware of this. So I think anybody who's listening, if you have a client who has done an estate freeze this year or, or is contemplating an estate freeze and they are philanthropic, this is a strategy that they really have to know about. We, had a, about. we, had, a, we had a client that had a $28 million freeze value, a $7 million tax. We turned it into a $13 million gift, right? And we created a $6 million CDA for the next generation. It was just the pieces work beautifully, providing you have the right team around to help uh, orchestrate this. And, and you can see from this example that the insurance pays for itself. Like, it, it, you know, the, the amount, the net benefit to the family is far and above what the insurance cost. So it, it, it's very good. A great idea. We love it. Yeah. Um, as long as somebody's insurable or at least one spouse is insurable and they have charitable intentions, it's, it's very, very doable. Beautiful. Okay. What else do we have? We um, last, this I, flip the slide there. We got one yeah, here, one last area. Uh, actually, so this, this is, uh, oh, sorry. yeah, one more. There we go. Well, actually you can leave it there for one second. This just okay. shows the net benefit of the idea we just talked about. Mm -hmm. Um, the net benefit is about four and a half million dollars and who gets that benefit. Well, 2 million of that goes to the foundation. The other 2.5 million goes to the family. That's sort of how that breaks down. Lovely. Okay. Yeah. Retirees. So we have some retirees. Uh, so we have no, I have no uh, specific slides to go through here. I just want to talk about a couple of things. Um, first of all, um, it is possible to contribute to an RSP beyond age 71. And that can be done in two ways. Number one, if you've got a spouse who still has an RSP because they're under 71, you can contribute to a spousal RSP. That makes, just makes really good sense. You know, the donor, the, the person contributing the money to the RSP gets the tax deduction. Um, and then also another way to do this is by what we call a seniors over contribution. Now, what does this look like? Well, if you're in your 71st year, you have to wind up your RSP by the end of that year. Normally you convert it to a RIF. But if you're expecting to have some earned income beyond age 71, maybe you have a company and you can pay yourself some salary out of the company, uh, or you're still working part time, you may have earned income beyond age 71. So what you can do is this, you can actually contribute before you wind up your RSP at the end of age 71, you can contribute to your RSP one more time, make it a very large contribution, um, not only this year's contribution, but enough of a contribution for next year and maybe even the year after that. You can say, well, why would I contribute for the next year and the year after that? Um, well, you will be, um, you will have an over contribution to your RSP and there will be a small penalty on that. Um, but you will be creating RSP contribution room next year and the year after that with because of your earned income. So you're still allowed to have an RSP, a sort of RSP deductions you can claim beyond age 71. So as long as you have earned income beyond age 71, you can contribute to your RSP beforehand, before you wind it up, and claim the deduction in the future years as your RSP contribution room opens up. So I'm not sure that made sense. I've written about that in the past. Um, I've got some Globe Mail articles that, that I could send you on that. Please, so that we can post it on the on the LinkedIn uh, when it gets circulated back to yep. the... Uh, Absolutely. Great. One last thing I want to talk about. Um, you can go to the next slide, I think, yep. uh, like general yep. ideas. Here's a general idea to really think about. Um, if you are an employee and you're used to getting a refund every single year that you work, it's a lot of people, right? If you contribute to RSP or you make donations or whatever, you may be getting refunds every year. Well, rather than getting a big refund in April, why not apply to the CRA to have your taxes deducted reduced? This is the time of year to do it. 
all right, November, December, because you have to um, uh, fill out a form called T form T1213, right? So what you're doing is you're applying, you're saying to the government, look, here's all the deductions and credits I'm expecting to claim next year. So I'm going to get a refund. So just don't, don't deduct as much from my pay to begin with. And what that can do is it can put more money in your pocket throughout the course of the year. You're not going to get a big refund at the end of the year, but it gives you more cash throughout the year, which of course you can do a number of things with, including increasing your giving to charity, not just at the end of the year, but throughout the year. Something to think about there. Which is also an idea that we like to uh, to promote around uh, RSP RIF tax uh, giving or tax conversion strategies, where you know there's a withholding tax normally of thirty percent on anything of withdrawals over fifteen thousand dollars, and again using that twelve thirteen form, you know there's a way for you to donate that without the withholding tax and at a cost of three and a half percent for donations as opposed to giving the government fifty three point five three percent on that. So that could be done with some or great all idea. of RSPs or RIFs, and 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 that's really uh, those were some great. Anything else, Tim? On any other ideas before we wrap up with some questions or just uh just some um, what, I, what i will say is this um yesterday in the global mail i um and i've written about this before i provided some year-end tax ideas for employees and coming up next week and the following week after that i'll be writing about some year-end tax ideas for business owners retirees and investors some of these we've talked about already today although today i shared probably um, some more advanced kinds of ideas that I'm not always going to write about in the Global Mail. Uh, but I, I would encourage you to maybe look for those things um, for sort of a checklist of ideas that you might want to consider. Because uh, there's there's quite a, quite a few things that could be done before year end, um, particularly if you're, yeah, I mean, employee, business owner, retiree, employee, there's, there's things that can be done. Fantastic, Tim. Here's Tim's contact information. If you should uh, desire getting hold of him, Tim, I'm sure you're available for a consultation. Their, their services sure. are exceptional in terms of working with families of affluence, um, really putting it all together, not just getting Tim's tax advice, but also on their investment side. Uh, Tim's partner, Neil Nisker, is one of the top investment professionals for many, many decades. And, uh, and they seem to find some wonderful investment opportunities for clients that would not normally be available through traditional banking and, and, and whatnot. So I think that's, that's fantastic. And then just in terms of wrapping up on our end, you know, I just did something recently, a 10 year and tax saving strategies. Tim covered a lot of these, but there's much more, right? So uh, what we're really encouraging people is this is not a cookie cutter. It's not like instant coffee. It's really, you know, Let's talk to you about your particular situation or your your chair, your 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 donors information to sort of look at the big picture and try to find ways for them to create money for charity, often just by converting taxes into charity. We call that making people into accidental philanthropists. There are two types of people. There are people who give because it's part of their DNA, their education, and then there are those who just don't. But when they realize they could give their taxes to charity as opposed to writing that check to Ottawa, they suddenly become accidental philanthropists. And the people who are already giving who learn these ideas can now give more at less cost or give the same amount at less cost. So it's really, you know, there is a, a certain, you know, ability here that you have to have in order to, to be able to see how this all works. So in terms of next steps, you know, I always have something called the 48 hour rule. If something resonated with you here, please reach out to me, reach out to Tim. Let's have a conversation, connect with Tim on LinkedIn. He's always posting information as am I. Uh, we have an entire tax letter digest of about 150 articles for, uh, since 2011, which cover a lot of the ideas that we cover Tim as well. And we have one pager, case studies as well that we'd love to share on, on, on some of those ideas and learn about it and, uh, and do it yourself or at minimum collaborate. We're really here as a resource for clients and our clients today, because of the complexity of things, they really need a team. You need a team looking at things from their different verticals, talking to each other in order to really optimize our clients' estates. So please reach out. We'd love to help you. And if you're involved with any charities, we're helping charities from across the country with their plan legacy giving and working with their major donors to help create more cost and tax effective gifts. And then if you're an advisor, we have a, a program called powerofplatinum.com 
There's the URL. It's a mentoring and coaching program that's one year long. We're starting our next cohort uh, November the 23rd. I do this with my partner, Jim Ruda, but we've taken advisors who were interested in this space and provided them with a way to now get really in front of high net worth clients, do six, seven figure insurance premiums, have a lot more fun, be more you know, focused on their unique abilities. And that's something that you might want to look at as well. And just in terms of our contact information, here it is. Uh, as far as questions, Tim, um, there was one that I had here on um, uh, when you were um, the tax installments. And mm -hmm. they asked, doesn't that increase the tax rate? They were ask, asking when you were doing that that strategy. Uh, well, it depends. It depends on what your current marginal tax rate is. A lot of times, uh, business owners, if they're in the highest tax bracket already, then um, it's not going to increase your tax rate. It, you know, it's, it, it does depend. You need to look at that. And it's a good thought. So take a look. You know, if you're not drawing any other income out of your corporation, you only bring you, you bring it out you know, twice as much every second year, you might end up paying more tax. So you have to watch for that. But in the right situations, it works. Beautiful. There was one. Uh couple of other questions. One of them asked about, is there something they could do with their CPP, their, their Canada pension plan, if they're philanthropic? And and I've said this before, and I'll just bring it out, that uh, most of our high net worth clients are getting CPP. They don't need it. It's just tax reinvested. And they also have to realize when they die, it dies with them. If they're philanthropic, why not give that CPP to charity and have a neutral tax on that CPP? And now you've got a, a gifting strategy. Or if you want to create a legacy gift, use that CPP to acquire a life insurance policy that's owned by charity. Now your CPP is considered a charitable donation. So you've got uh, no tax on that. And you've created a large legacy gift as well, which I know, Tim, you've written about as well. Yeah, I love that idea. It's it's great. You know, if, if, if you have the luxury of a little bit more cash flow than you need, there's so much you can do that's creative. Yeah, and the last question I sat here see here is somebody has an existing life insurance policy and they don't need it, right? So they're you know they're it doesn't it's not going to move the dial on their family's estate plan, and they'll like to know what could they do with that that would benefit charity and benefit them, Tim. I mean, this is our my my wheelhouse, but so is it yours. So yeah, yeah. The, as you know, you talked earlier about the ability to donate insurance to charity. You can you can transfer ownership of a policy to charity, in which case you could be entitled to a donation tax credit for cash value that you're you're transferring over. Um, you could buy a policy on uh, in the name of a charity. You could do that. You could donate the premium uh, amounts to charities and get donations for each premium that you contribute to the charities, or you know cash that you donate to the charity that you can then use for premiums. So there's lots of ways. I think, Mark, you're the expert in how to donate insurance to charity, but there's so much you can leverage the insurance uh, to make much, much larger gifts than you could ever make on your own, even with, from capital or income during your lifetime. So it's it's something worth thinking about. And if people haven't explored it, they really should look at that. And certainly with, uh, I know Canada Life launched a, a new product at the end of, of March, was it April? It's it's the first insurance product or policy launched in Canada that has only one premium. It's owned by a charity or your private foundation or donor advised fund with only one premium. So it's not the servicing all the way along, which means if somebody's had some sort of liquidity event and they want to do a legacy gift, one premium, they get the charitable benefit, but the gift on the other end, the net benefit to them based on their net cost of that donation works out to anywhere between eight to 20 times larger than their net cost. Plus it's a type of policy that can actually produce an income or cash flow to charities while you're alive through the dividends as well. So lots out there. It's really around sitting down and having a conversation and, and seeing how we can help. So I just want to finish Tim. It was great seeing you. Thank you so much for joining us. Your information was outstanding, spectacular. I'm sure we're going to get lots of uh, good feedback and questions. And I want to thank everybody for joining us today. We have some, our next uh, uh, philanthropy Friday is going to be on October the 27th. I'm proud to have Adam Aptowitzer, uh, who you know, he's a partner at KPMG, tax law and, and, and um, non-for-profit non uh, charities. And the topic is going to be called Use It or Lose It, Finding Gifts in Kind to Cash In on to cash in on missed tax credits. So please join me on October 27th. And then on November 10th, I'm going to be joined by Alan Naiman 
uh, also <laughs> coincidentally a partner at KPMG, we're doing an event for Humber River Hospital Foundation where they're going to be inviting their donors and their community professionals all on end of year uh, charitable strategies as well that people, I'm sure that you covered off on a lot of these, Tim, but I'm sure there'll be some others that we can be talking about at that time as well. There's no no shortage of good ideas. Absolutely. Looking Thank you very much. Good. Thank you very much. Everybody take care, stay safe, and uh, we'll hopefully see you again soon. Thanks very much for joining us. Bye-bye.